Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, July 15th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Republicans gather in Milwaukee, Wisconsin this week for the Republican National Convention. Mississippi delegates are there under the specter of an attack on Trump. Then lawmakers have to consider their options. Federal courts rule the state must redraw several Senate and House districts. Plus, a doctor shares some ways to beat the summer allergy season. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Forty delegates from Mississippi's Republican Party are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin this week for the convention, just two days after a suspected assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump. He was campaigning in Pennsylvania Saturday when it happened. This week is typically a time when Trump announces his major political goals for office and selects his running mate. But the recent assassination attempt could lead to some last-minute changes in how the Republican Party moves forward. Discussions are underway about a more unifying message. Friday, the day before the shooting, our Will Stribling spoke with the GOP chair for the state, Mike Hurst, who was already in Wisconsin preparing for the convention. He talked about expectations for this week's speeches and announcements. The city is being swarmed with good conservative Republicans, and the excitement is palpable. Everybody is pumped up and, and ready for the convention to start, and Frankly, we're ready to nominate President Donald J. Trump to be our Republican candidate for the president of the United States. Yeah, and what what are you expecting to see during the convention next week? Well, I'm expecting to see people just being excited, people being pumped up, people just expressing their support and, frankly, their admiration for uh, Donald Trump and the conservative policies that we expect him to bring back to the White House when we elect him in November. If you were at, you know, the 2016 or 2020s, uh, conventions, how do you expect this time to compare, you know, being the, the third time that, that, that Trump is, is set to receive that nomination? Yeah, so I was an alternate delegate in the 2016 uh, Republican National Convention in Cleveland, and it was a very similar feel. Uh, what I can tell you today is, though, um, it, it seems like people are even more excited and fired up about the prospect of renominating President Trump and putting him on the ballot to uh, to be president during the election come November. Other than the, all the other things that just make this election really significant, we're also in the opposition of heading into the convention and former President Trump has not named his, his running mate yet. What's the conversation around that like right now? Are y'all expecting that to just be a big, a big reveal at the convention? I, I do. I think it will be a big reveal. What I can tell you is the Republican bench is very deep. The names that are being floated around right now are very well qualified and those who are super conservative and I think will carry on the mantle of the values and principles that we hold dear as Republicans. So, yeah, I think people are excited to uh, to see what transpires Wednesday night. Yeah, and you said that the energy is already palpable, but I imagine that the conversation around the outlook of the election has changed in the past week with the uh, issues that President Biden has had and the Democratic infighting and chaos going on right now. Yeah, it's it's been incredibly sad to watch ever since the debate between President Trump and President Biden just a few weeks ago. Um, You know, from a human being perspective, it's sad to see the, the mental decline and the physical decline of President Biden. But from an American, you know, just citizen perspective, um, we need to make sure that President Biden is not reelected, because right now we don't know who's running this country. And to have um, someone in charge who doesn't know where he is, doesn't know who he's talking to, can't recognize names or, or faces, it, that's, that, that's scary to the American people. And so I think uh, what we're doing right now here in Milwaukee, trying to renominate President Trump, trying to get him on all ballots and trying to get him elected in November is it's something that's important to all of us as Americans. And how do you think that the party just at the nationwide level and, and also in the states is going to capitalize on and utilize this moment? Well, I think I think folks are motivated right now. You no, know, we're not taking anything for granted. We've got four months to get out the vote. We've got four months to mobilize the forces. Um, you know, I think every American should 
think about this election when they go to the gas pump or they go to the grocery store and they see that prices that we pay as Americans have risen over 20 percent in just three and a half years during the Biden administration's presidency. You know, we have to think about all the illegal aliens streaming over our open, unsecured border and how that is affecting us as Americans, not just with, you know, potential jobs being taken away from us, but also just with our safety, with crime being committed. Um, there are a lot of things that, that we take for granted, but that affect us every single day uh, based upon the the person that we nominate and the person we elect as president. So this is going to be one of the most consequential, I believe, presidential elections that we've had in, in, in our lifetime. Yeah, you already brought up some issues in that, that last answer, but um, just from your conversation with, with Mississippi voters across the state, what are their biggest concerns right now, and and what are you hoping to see addressed in, both in the Republican Party platform and then by a second Trump administration if he's reelected in November? Yeah, I think first and foremost for Mississippians is our economy, and they, they've seen over the last three and a half years under the Biden administration where our economy has declined, prices for the average Mississippian has risen uh, over 20 percent. Um, they see the border continue to be overrun by illegal aliens and, and frankly, those who are really intent on doing harm to us as Americans from you know, terrorist sales to drug cartels to human traffickers. Um, and, and frankly, the, the, the out of control crime that is running rampant across our country as well, including here in our capital city of Jackson. So I think all of these issues are things that are on the forefront of the minds of Mississippians. And I think they, they will be thinking about those things when Election Day rolls around November 5th. That's Mississippi GOP Chair Mike Hurst speaking with MPB's Will Stribling on Friday. One day after that, there was an assassination attempt on former Republican President Donald Trump. Coming up, lawmakers have to consider their options as a federal court rules the state must redraw several Senate and House district lines. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB. Think Radio. Autocorrect on MPB Think Radio, helping you correct your auto problems. Our host is Coach Charlie Milton, ASC Certified Master Technician. Let me help save you some money working on your cars. Listen to our podcast, Autocorrect. Do you look forward to Mondays? You do if you listen to MPB. Deep South Dining is food and Southern culture. Now you're talking with Marshall Ramsey is compelling stories with interesting people. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit gives you suggestions to better your life. The phone lines open up at 9 a.m. for you to talk to our experts on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. A panel of federal judges have ruled Mississippi lawmakers need to correct voting rights violations in the state's Senate and House electoral maps by January. But the state's election commission, comprised entirely of Republicans, says that's not enough time to properly address the issue before the November elections. Courts found evidence two Senate districts and one House district dilute the voting power of black Mississippians. The state could appeal the court's decision, but if it's not overturned, lawmakers will have to adopt new voting maps before the 2025 session. Our Michael McEwen speaks with Democratic Senator John Horn of Jackson about how the state may need to address the issue. The result of the ruling is that we'll get a couple more uh, majority black districts in the legislature. I, I, I don't think that politically it's going to have that much impact. Uh, what we really need, in my opinion, are more impact districts where rep, uh, the, the, the percentages of Republicans versus Democrats or Democrats versus Republicans are in the state. We need, need to close the gap on that, I, I believe. There are too many majority black districts and there are too many majority white districts. And, and so politics tends to be polarizing uh, as a result of that. And I think that, that we have, if we were to, to, to put more uh, seats that were impact seats, uh, impact districts in place, I think the state would be much better off. Mm-hmm. Could you just, just walk me through that a little more? Maybe 
for some who aren't as familiar with politics? Well, you know, in order to create a lot of, of, of super uh, black majority districts, the, the other uh, consequence is that you have a lot of super white majority districts. And, and so now the group may feel that they have to listen to the other side. And I think that that's where we are in Mississippi. We, ha- we have a lot of majority black districts. There are, there are 52, I think, seats in the, in the House and 15 in the Senate which means we've got in the Senate 37 uh, super white majority districts. And so blacks tend to be Democrats and whites tend to be Republicans, although that's not entirely the case now in Mississippi. But but, but there is that polarization. And it, it seems to me that, that we're doing the state of disservice when, when we don't um, uh, establish more districts where there's a, 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 a tighter and, and closer parity between whether you're Republican or Democrat. A lot of majority black districts are 65, 70 percent black. And that means there are a lot of white districts are 65, 70 percent white. And and so when, when you have that kind of polarization, uh, there's a tendency that, that the person representing those those entities uh, may feel that they don't need to listen to the other side, that, that um, they have to, to play to the one that brung them. And I, and I think if we had more districts that would say 40, 45 percent black or 40, 45 percent white, it, it means that, that the candidates have to listen to, to all part, parties and, and I think be a little fairer in how they, they represent folks. Mm-hmm. So a criticism that I've heard or maybe an observation I've heard of the 2022 districting map or the districting vote when they drew the districts was that it happened very quickly I think what I was told was within like 10 minutes, basically they showed the maps in the chambers, they voted on it, and that was that. Well, you know, um, members tend to be ter- very territorial and, and self-centered. That You know, I think a lot of guys and, and gals would look at uh, these maps that were redrawn, and they, their concern is, what is it going to do to my district? Mm-hmm. Not looking at the overall uh, status of things and... and uh, perhaps having um, uh, a sense that this map needs to be fairer just overall as opposed to, well, I, as long as my district's fine, I'm okay with this. Mm-hmm. And Would you agree that that's an issue in Mississippi's case? Is that an issue on both sides of the aisle down in the legislature? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, as I say, uh, politicians tend to be self-centered. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you think would be required to maybe change that approach to districting in the state? Well, I I think it may be time for an independent uh, board to be responsible for drawing the lines of redistricting for legislative seats here in Mississippi. Uh, There are several states that have independent boards as opposed to to the party that's in charge or that has the most numbers. Uh, and, and, And the way things are now, that's who controls the process. So <laughs> you're you're trying to, to hold on to power as, as long as you can. And so you draw lines accordingly. Do you think this order, you know, your experience in the legislature, do you think this order would maybe be the impetus needed for the state to push for an independent board or is no, it more no, necessary? No, I, I, I don't think that we're going to see that anytime soon. As I say, uh, the guys who are in charge don't want that. and And so they'd have to agree. Uh, to an independent board, and I don't see it in, I don't see it in the cards right now. Mm-hmm. 1964, you know, it's been 60 years since then. I think, with with the many hallmark moments in civil rights in Mississippi, 64 Freedom Summer, that massive effort to expand the vote, I think that really comes to mind. You were speaking of the, there's both the plethora of majority black districts in the state, majority white districts, typically voting follows those lines by party. Yeah, but, you know, the other side of it is is that um, if you are wanting to look at, at whether things are fair or not, let's look at, you know, what kind of, of representation we have in the state uh, for African Americans. There's at least a 38 percent black population base here in the state, but we don't have 38 percent representation mm-hmm. in the House or the Senate. So with that exactly in mind, you know, what do you make? We're, it, it's 60 years since that massive effort, and we're still trying to address some of these questions systemically in Mississippi's yeah. governance. Well, I, I think that, that what we're seeing in this country is an attempt to roll back many of the gains that were made in the 60s in terms of civil rights and uh, voter participation and equality. 
uh, that, that certainly uh, is the message that you're seeing come out of, of some of the far right uh, con- conservative uh, elements in the country. You know, this project 2025 is is out there and, and is part of a, a cornerstone of their uh, platform is to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion in in the, the country, and also to roll back the, the gains that were made by African Americans in civil rights. And I think that's very dangerous because um, it 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 is not us putting our best foot forward, and it it sows uh, a lot of strife and tension. Uh, and um, it does not uh, allow f- for us to uh, have our, our our better angels come forward. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of the devil that comes out. That's Democratic Senator John Horn of Jackson. Coming up, a doctor shares some ways to beat the summer allergy season. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. If you aren't near a radio, you can still listen to MPB Think Radio and MPB Music Radio. You can download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone or listen online at mpbonline.org. Do you look forward to Mondays? You do if you listen to MPB. Deep South Dining is food and Southern culture. Now you're talking with Marshall Ramsey is compelling stories with interesting people. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit gives you suggestions to better your life. The phone lines open up at 9 a.m. for you to talk to our experts on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Summer in Mississippi can be a hard time of the year for many folks who struggle with allergies, high humidity, and high pollen counts are thriving. Allergists say this is often something that prevents folks from going outside and being active, but it doesn't have to. Dr. Jennifer Olivier is with the Hattiesburg Clinic Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She talks with our Kobe Vance about ways to avoid the worst causes and symptoms of summer allergies. Most folks associate pollen that they can see with allergy season. But in reality, each season, spring, summer, fall, is affiliated with a, quote, allergy season. In our area, we're considered a very tropical climate. So we have a lot of variables that can contribute towards sinus symptoms or colloquially allergy symptoms. And so for us, when it's really hot and it rains, there's high humidity. So as an indoor allergen perspective, your dust mite count is going to be very high. They thrive on humidity. If you go way out west, humidity can get less than 50%. They don't have the dust mite problems. And when we say Allergy to dust, this is house dust mite, not necessarily dust on a road, per se. And so the other factors you have, rain will bring in mold. So when it rains, your pollen counts are decreased, but your mold spores can be higher. Also, our Mississippi weather can be a little volatile. And so when you have high winds, it kicks up everything. So the air quality is terrible. You have a lot of debris that can include pollens and mold spores and other irritants as well. And then when it's really dry and sunny, yes, your pollen counts will go up. Again, springtime is tree pollen, summer is grass pollen, fall is gonna be your weed pollen time of year. And on top of that, when you have these storms, like let's say hurricane season, which we are in, you have to also be considered of barometric pressures. Barometric pressure shifts, temperature shifts will also cause non-allergic or vasomotor allergy type symptoms. It's not truly your immune system recognizing something. You just have these extra little receptors making you have congestion, sneezing, post-nasal drip, etc. Can having these allergies be a deterrent for people to go outside? Or do you find that in your clinic? That is a very real thing, especially in the pediatric population. You've heard parents say, I can't get my kid off their tablet. But if their kid has horrific asthma or really bad allergic rhinitis, absolutely. It's a huge deterrent because if the child goes outside, they might get sick and that causes other issues. 
you know, socioeconomic. Parents have to take off work, doctor bills, or social factors, anxiety. I don't want to go out there. I don't want to feel bad. So that is a very real problem. How severe can some of these symptoms manifest themselves? I guess if somebody has never really been tested for things like asthma, what's the bar that you tell them, like, hey, if you're having these kind of issues, you probably need to go talk to your doctor? Typically, it depends on someone's quality of life. So if someone's got the occasional sneeze, sure, simple over-the-counter stuff may help them. Typically, I see patients when it's affecting their everyday quality of life, and that's very much what this is. They can't sleep at night. They're congested. They're snoring. It might contribute towards sleep apnea. It can contribute towards asthma symptoms. So now they really can't breathe, which can make them at risk for hospitalization, ER visits, recurrent steroids, which is also another ball of wax with complications within someone's personal health. They can have other very bad side effects as far as bone density problems, cataracts, weight gain, increased fat disposition. So it's very much a large myriad of a balance. Okay, you have these symptoms, let's get you tested, but let's also get you adequate treatment to help prevent a lot of other potential devastating complications down the road. What are some possible treatments for people out there who might be struggling with allergies at this time of year? I always recommend saline, and they have a newer saline with xylitol. And the reason for that is because we breathe in a lot of these allergens, a lot of these irritants. So it's always a great idea to get rid of it. If you're going outside, get rid of it. Saline's natural, and xylitol is a natural sugar that can also help with bacterial biofilms. It can help be an antiviral. So it's something you can do as often as you want naturally. The next step of that would be an intranasal steroid spray. Intranasal steroid sprays are over-the-counter. A common brand name might be Flonase or Fluticazone as a generic, things like that. That's honestly first-line treatment, not your over-the-counter antihistamines. So intranasal steroid sprays for at least two weeks are really your key agent. You also have intranasal antihistamines that work brilliant with the intranasal steroid. And then as a third line, for those who just have horrific sneezing, itching, that's where I usually incorporate the antihistamines like Azertec, Cetirizine, Allegra, things like that. Indoors, I know a lot of people have to deal with the filters in their air conditioner. What are your suggestions for the style of filter people should get if they have allergies in the home, and how often should they be changing that out? When it comes to those allergy filters, you have to be careful because a lot of times those filters are very thick, and it might affect your air conditioning systems. And if those air conditioning systems fail, of course, that leads to other horrific problems in Mississippi especially. So I usually say don't focus as much on your air filter. Make sure it's the correct air filter to make sure your air conditioning system is going to work. I'd rather you have a air purifier in a size that matches the room. And on a really good allergy treatment program, really it shouldn't be that big of a problem. So I would say if anybody is struggling, I highly recommend they see an allergist immunologist to identify the source of the problem and to truly get a individualized treatment plan to improve quality of life because if it's affecting let's say a family it can affect parents and kids let's make sure everybody's taken care of so that everybody has a better quality of life dr jennifer olivier is with the hattiesburg clinic allergy asthma and immunology this has been mississippi edition on mpb think radio